Um, thank you, Shivani. Um, I remember the first time I saw a Grevy zebra. I was driving along the road in Samburu, and um, this beautiful animal just sort of cantered across the road in front of me and sort of turned back to stare at me. And I remember thinking to myself that I'm, it almost seems like I'm in the presence of something that has been around for thousands of years. You know, they're beautiful animals. They seem wise beyond their years. So there are amazing animals that live in the arid rangelands of northern Kenya. They live with other communities. They live with communities, the Samburu, Rendile, and Turkana communities, and they play a critical role um, in the traditional cultures of these communities. They sometimes lead the way to pasture and water during drought years. They alert livestock herders to the presence of wildlife, uh, of predators. And it's also believed that Grevy zebra their presence in the landscape indicates the onset of rains, which is amazing. It's such a critical resource for the communities. Often enough, you can see Grevy zebra grazing in these rangelands with cattle. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize that didn't change. <laughs> so yeah, so they're absolutely beautiful animals. They're absolutely amazing to look at. They're absolutely amazing to be in the presence of. So Grevy zebra are much larger than their plain zebra cousins. They have these beautiful thin white stripes that don't meet under their belly. So they have this pure white stomach. They have an elongated snout and a brown, brown muzzle. But most characteristic about the Grevy zebra is their beautiful round white ears, sort of fuzzy. Grevy zebra and plain zebra also differ in behavior. Grevy zebra occupy the dry, arid landscapes of northern Kenya. Territorial males sort of hold these vast expanses of territory. And these females that move around in groups sort of access these territories looking for water and pasture. Unfortunately, Grevy zebra are endangered. Compared to the other two species of Grevy zebra, uh, compared to the other two species of zebra in Africa, only 3,000 remain in the wild. And that's a very, very low population. Their population has declined by 80 percent since the 1970s, and this represents one of the most dramatic declines of any large mammal species in Africa. Grevy zebra are only found in Kenya and Ethiopia, where less than 1% of their range is formally protected. 93% of that population is only found in Kenya. So Grevy zebra are really specialized to these dry, arid environments. These territorial males hold these large territories, and these females move through these territories looking for pasture and water. Grevy zebra normally can go up to five days without water, but a Grevy zebra female in a fall requires water every other day. So Grevy zebra are threatened by a number of different factors. One of the biggest threats to Grevy zebra is habitat loss as a result of overgrazing by livestock. Plants and vegetation and grasses are one of the most important resources, not just for wildlife, but for people in northern Kenya. It's vital for all life to exist in that area. But overgrazing by livestock has this very detrimental effect, and it doesn't just affect the future of Grevy zebra in the landscape, but it also affects the future of predators, for example. As their prey base disappears, they're forced to uh, feed on livestock, for example, increasing conflict with humans. This picture here shows another key threat to Grevy zebra. Loss of habitat through large Pan-African developments. Um, for example, this is a transmission line running through Grevy zebra habitat north towards Ethiopia. And this is just the beginning. Along this route, there's also an oil pipeline in, in development, a highway, and a railway. And these projects are going to cut Grevy zebra habitat in two trajectories, sort of north towards Ethiopia and northwest towards Sudan. And that sounds really bleak. It sounds like the future of Grevy zebra is really bleak, but we're really hopeful. We've partnered with Owasso Lions 
to, um, to foster sort of this positive approach to mitigating the, the threat of infrastructure development to Grevy zebra and other wildlife in this area. This is the unfortunate reality of what Grevy zebra have to go through within their environment. They're hunted to date still, run down by poachers on motorbikes, run down to exhaustion, so they become tired and much more vulnerable to gunshots. They become an easy target. And with urbanization and development of towns, their meat is sold within these towns, and unfortunately, their fat is also used for their perceived medicinal value. So what are we doing about it? So Grevy Zebra Trust was established in 2007, and we're the only organization that is 100% dedicated towards conserving this endangered species. Over 93% of our team comes from the local communities. Within the area that we work in, we work with warriors, elders, women, and children, both school-going and herder children, as this is a demographic that's often missed out uh, when it comes to outreach and awareness. We have three main areas of focus within our line of work. We focus on Grevy zebra population health and monitoring. We focus on healthy habitats that support Grevy zebra and community livelihoods. And we also focus on impacting the negative, um, the negative infrastructure developments that are forthcoming within Kenya. In 2017, we had a very, very severe drought, and this sort of this highlights the direct interventions that we're doing when it comes to monitoring population health. The drought was very severe, so Gravy Zebra Trust, with a host of other partners, initiated a supplementary feeding effort to target the most vulnerable populations of Gravy Zebra. It took a huge amount of effort and so many resources, and we ended up feeding 3,500 bales of hay to Grevy Zebra in, the most in where the populations were, were most vulnerable. The reason we do this is so that we can stop Grevy Zebra from losing body condition. Once they lose body condition, they become much more susceptible to disease. So we want to stop that body condition from dropping. So it took a huge amount of effort, but despite that effort, we still lost 5% of, of the Grevy zebra population in Kenya. During that drought, during the height of the drought, we had this amazing visitor come to our camp. She came on the 1st of April, and she was so skinny, she looked so sick, she had diarrhea, she was thirsty, she was starving, and straight away, our team went into action. So they put out hay in all these different locations. They um, set up little water points that she was able to access. On the 4th of April, she was still there, so she was named Naisabwa, which means the visitor. And she stayed there for 10 days. Her body condition improved rapidly, and the community around Grevy Zebra Trust Field Camp just couldn't believe, why is this Grevy, how did this Grevy Zebra know to go to the Grevy Zebra Trust Field Camp, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, we tried to explain, it's because we still have grass, we have grass there, but they, they refused to believe it. And today she's become a legend, and, but they still believe she's, she's from the realm of the magical, you know? And she's become really special within our hearts. We, we always remember Nice Subway. She, she was an example of some of of the dire situation that Grevy Zebra are in, but also, with support, they can overcome those challenges. So managing water is one of the critical things that we do, and this photo just highlights um, one of our water pans in Lysamis, where the community, with our support, manages this water pan, so it's wildlife dedicated. Just to highlight um, another I think a really strong case as to why water is so important. I also wanted to highlight the story of Kangware. She started working with GZT in 2017, and um, I, around the first week that she started working with GZT, she was walking along this dry riverbed, and um, she saw these two grevy zebra that were trying to access these little dots of water sort of scattered around, but they weren't able to get any of that water out. So Kangware, she said to us that, my time has come, I know I have to do something, I know what my role is as a, 
as a Grevy Zebra Scout. I have to let these Grevy Zebra access water. So she dug a shallow well. Thankfully, the water table was still slightly high. So she was able to make this pool that was big enough. And, um, and then she went away. She sort of walked away and hid in the bushes to see what would happen. And these two Grevy Zebra um, came to this well, started drinking, satisfied their thirst, and walked away to find pasture. And Kangwari said, said to us that she felt this huge sigh of happiness go through her. You know, she felt that she had done something great that day. And that's such an inspirational story. I think it, it represents just what, how the community feels about Grevy Zebra. I also wanted to tell you the story of this fall. Uh, Lekurea, one of our um, Grevy Zebra warriors, he was coming back from having a bath somewhere, sort of walking back towards camp. And I was out, actually, at the camp that, um, that night. It's separate from our Grevy Zebra Trust field camp, a lot further north. And um, anyway, so he was coming back, walking towards the camp, and he heard this commotion. And... You know, so he went to see, oh, what was happening? And he came across this pack of hyenas that had surrounded this Grevy Zebra mother and foal. And he said to us, he knew he had to do something straight away, so he went straight towards that, you know, that fracas, tried to chase the hyenas away, but then realized, oops, I'm, I'm vulnerable here. There's this pack of hyenas around me. What am I going to do? So, um, so he shouted, you know, he screamed. He was relatively close to the other warriors that were at camp, so... The warriors woke up really suddenly because they heard this scream, and you never hear a warrior scream. <clears throat> it just doesn't happen, you know? So they knew something was wrong. So they rushed out and managed to get to him. And um, with their help, they were able to separate these hyenas from, from the zebras. Unfortunately, in that commotion, the, zebra, the Grevy zebra mother um, ran away. So the warriors were left with this fall. So they took her back to camp, and um, in fact, I remember waking up the next morning, seeing a fall at the camp and wondering, you know, what on earth is going on? How did I miss anything? You know, that night I slept through all of it. I don't know how, but, um, <laughs> you know, so they gave the fall food and water, and, um, and they were planning how they, they were going to connect this fall to its mother. So, so that morning, they, um, they, led the, they went to where that um, fracas had happened, where the commotion had happened, and looked for the Grevy zebra uh, mother's tracks, and followed the tracks for a couple of hours. And they saw this herd of Grevy zebra at the end, and released the fall into the herd, and five minutes later, she was suckling. Yeah, so... <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a really inspirational story. It's, it makes you so happy, but unfortunately, it represents some of the threats towards Grevy Zebra, you know. Grevy Zebra are having to travel these huge long distances at night, which they never did in the past, and it makes them so much more vulnerable to predators. These are our warriors. So these are the, this is the group that sort of came to Le Correa's help. And this is them out on, um, on camel patrol. So the warriors use camels to access some of the most isolated populations of Grevy Zebra in Kenya. It's areas that vehicles just can't go to. Having the camels carry all their, their supplies allows them to stay out in the fields for weeks on end. And during the drought in 2017, they were out there for three months, sort of monitoring these, population, these isolated Grevy zebra populations. And the camel patrols have been so significant in supporting GZT's understanding of these Grevy zebra populations. Since the camel patrol started, our sightings of Grevy zebra have gone up by 400%. And these are our scouts. So the Grevy Zebra scouts um, monitor the population of Grevy Zebra in this area called Wamba. We have 29 scouts, 20 of whom are women. And the scout program is, all of, is not just about monitoring Grevy Zebra, but it's about empowering women to monitor Grevy Zebra, to enter conservation. It allows these women to have a voice in the community. They're able to talk to elders, talk to warriors, you know, and sort of pass the message on about Grevy Zebra conservation. And the difference is, now, the communities are listening. So there's this impact that you're seeing. They're having a difference. These are our Grevy Zebra ambassadors, and they operate in some of the most isolated areas of, of, um, of Samburu County. 
One of the key things that the ambassadors aim to do is promote peace, because they work in an area where conflict is high between two tribes, the Samburu and Turkana. So as well as monitoring Gravi Zebra, their goal is also to promote peace within those regions. And that's also really important because Gravy Zebra get caught in conflict. So if there's fights happening, gunshots, if people are moving around continuously, um, whether it's for cattle raids, unfortunately, Gravy Zebra are sort of caught in the crossfire of that. If there's gunshots happening, Gravy Zebra are killed. And we've had a few cases of that. So, so the ambassadors really work to promote peace. And um, in, two th in 2017, we had a 69% reduction of, um, Gravy zebra, of Gravy Zebra poaching in that area. Also in Alberta, as part of our um, aim to promote peace, we had this really amazing uh, festival. It was called the We Are One Festival. And the aim of it was to bring the Samburu and Turkana people together and join in activities that sort of promoted shared identities. So over 300 community members came to this festival. It was held towards the end of, um, of 2017. And Christmas in 2017 was reported to be the most peaceful Christmas that had ever occurred within Alberta, which is a really successful story. But it's unfortunate that for a lot of warriors, for example, in this area, conflict is all they've ever known. So we're continually working to promote peace, but it's, it's an uphill struggle. But we, we really believe we're getting there because we're completely involving the community in everything that we're doing. One of the other ways in which we protect Gravy Zebra and other wildlife is through direct interventions. So, um, not that long ago, we had the Kenya Wildlife Service Veterinary Unit um, start in Samburu. And this unit is, um, was developed as a partnership both with Owasso Lions and Save the Elephants. So, we all work in the same area and came together to sort of fill this vital gap of um, wildlife interventions that was missing. To date, the vets have been treating elephants, Grevy zebra, you know, and so when we get reports of injured animals out there in the field, we're able to respond rapidly. So it's filling this vital gap um, that was there before, and um, this is just to highlight one of the successes that we've had to date, where the, they're treating an infected cut in a Grevy zebra. We've been monitoring the Grevy zebra, and he's doing really well now. Um, but it's just sort of highlighting how important, how vital that, um, that intervention was. So now, um, I'm very, very happy to welcome to the stage Peter Lalampa. Um, he manages one of the most critical pillars of um, Gravy Zebra Trust's work, rangeland rehabilitation. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sheila, for your wonderful presentation. Wow, to me, coming back to WCN after two years of a break, it's like coming home. So thank you, WCN. Thank you to all partners for having us back. As a young boy growing back in Kenya, I was lucky to have been born and brought up in Northern Kenya, where before I joined school, I had the initial activities of a young boy going out herding. In that time, when I take livestock out, I could monitor what my livestock ate. Monitoring what livestock ate means as a young pastoralist boy, you need to look for areas where there is good pasture, tall grass, nutritious grass, grass that will fatten your livestock. But the same areas where you find this grass are the same areas where you find wild, wildlife. So wildlife have been part and part of my life. They were my companion. They give me company as I go out herding livestock. But things have changed over time. I realize areas where I used to find grass, grass have disappeared. And I ask myself, what's happening in the landscape? As a young boy, I was so curious, so I could walk to my father and ask him, Dad, what's not happening? It's becoming harder and harder to feed livestock. What's going wrong? What are we not doing right? 
And I remember my dad could pick a stool and would tell me, son, can you just sit next to me? I want to tell you a story. And a story about the past. He could tell me a story on how within the same landscape, there was a lot of grass. There was diversity in terms of wildlife. The land was really breathing nicely and healthy. But things have changed over time. Grass have disappeared. The wildlife that we used to see in the same landscape have declined. Some have migrated in search of pasture. And I ask, why is it changing? Then he narrated another story. You know, in African culture, sitting around you further and being told a story was an education. So he could narrate a lot of stories. He told me how the pastoral communities used to migrate from Marsabit all the way to the foot of Mount Kenya. They were mobile. And as they moved, they give land recovery period for the same grass to regenerate. Mobility was an important component of their life. But what changed such that pastoralists are no longer mobile? He told me one thing. We've got so much glued to schools, health centers, shopping centers. Nobody wants now to go, want to go away from those amenities. And in a way, livestock now are grazing in the same area throughout the year. So that means grass are disappearing each and every year. I really felt sad. I really felt sad because I knew my livelihood, the livestock, are threatened. But I also felt sad because I knew my companions, their wildlife, are also facing the same problem. So I asked Dad, so what do we do? And he said, we need to work together as a community. We need to do something. Because plant is the foundation of wildlife and livestock economy. And they are not just playing that role alone. They are also playing a critical role, capture of rain. Whenever it rains and rain falls on bare ground, we are losing 80% of that water, either as runoff or we lose it through evaporation because of bare soil. So plants play also a critical role in making sure that we capture rain. But having had these changes, we are now seeing water falling on bare areas and losing all this water. And so what are we doing to address this? Because I felt like it's my responsibility it's the responsibility of the community, the pastoral community that I come from, to take care of their land. A paradigm shift has to happen. A mindset has to change. And what's the change that we envisage? Seeing livestock as a tool instead of seeing them as a problem. I'm sure some of you are wondering, how on earth can they become a tool, yet they're the very same you know, cause of the problem, that's of aggression. That's the mindset we want to see. Livestock, the soil health requires the hoofs, the dung, the urine of the herbivores for it to heal. And that's the concept. Those are the principles we are trying to employ within the areas where we are working. Using livestock as a tool instead of seeing them as a problem. This cannot happen without structures, without effective community communication, without community unity. And so we work through community conservancies, one of the structures within Northern Kenya, in order to be able to impact this knowledge. So we train grazing committees. We also train the boards on rangeland issues, on health of the land, and through this, we establish also learning sites. These learning sites are where we rehabilitate the land, use the livestock to till the ground, use the livestock through their enclosures at night, 
And through this rehabilitation, we have seen amazing results. Some of them is this particular area. This was a purely bare area. And we did just put livestock kraal in the same area. After one rainy season, the results were amazing. In this picture, I couldn't hold myself back. You know, seeing the results was so fulfilling. I just had to go down, sit down, without even looking for a share, because there was enough cover. So I didn't mind that my clothes would become Dutch. These are the fulfillment that we get when we work with the community. But also, rangeland work requires innovative strategies. And this is one of the innovative strategies that we use as GZT, as Grave Zebra Trust. Using an hybrid model, the conservancy model, as well as the traditional system. The traditional system, each of the social group has a responsibility. And so we use traditional practices or ceremonies, like one that's shown by this picture, women coming together and doing what we call Ntorosi. Ntorosi is a time for prayer. Ntorosi is a time for creating awareness. So instead of us devising new mechanism, we use already existing structures within the traditional system to pass the messages. But also because we realize that we've lost our culture, using this traditional mechanism revives old ways that were important for the health of the land. So these ladies, 40 women of Westgate Community Conservancy, went through all their songs, creating awareness on the state of the rangeland. It was really powerful. But as we work with the elders, as we work with the women, we must invest in the future. You cannot only think about today. You need to think about tomorrow. And so we work with the youth, both the school-going kids, as well as the harder kids. We bring them together. We train them on rangeland. We train them on issues of pasture, and this kid really go back passing the same message to their peers as well as to their parents. And they form a club. We call it Chokuti, Ekramatun Kujit, means grass guidance. These guys, when they form the club, some of the participants have also taken measures within their community. And I just want to give a story of one of the participants. This is a young boy, he was actually the youngest. He was called Ltiati. So Ltiati, after the field school, he went back doing his normal work of herding livestock. Then one day, he was really exhausted and he was walking back home after herding. As he got closer to the settlement, he found one elder cutting a tree, cutting the branches of the tree in order to renew his fence. Then he asked him, Dad, I learned in the field school that cutting down of trees is bad because it will affect our environment. Then the elder told him, well, you know, what can a kid tell me? I've seen all this over my years. So what are you telling? Can you just go and take your livestock back home? The other tried to persuade him. He tried to convince him to stop cutting the tree. But the elder gave him a deaf ear. He dismissed him. Feeling sad, feeling sudden, he tried to walk back home, and he called the elders. And he told them, I've met so-and-so cutting down a tree. I've tried to tell him what I learned in the field school, but he couldn't listen to me. So elders decided to call for a meeting of the whole community. And the boy was brought before the elders to narrate his story. He narrated. And the elder was asked, is it true that the boy tried to persuade you about not cutting the trees? Then out of shame, he couldn't say yes, but he looked down on the ground. So the elders decided, in order for him to learn and others to learn that it's important to, learn, to listen to our kids, he was fined. He was told he must give out one of his goats that will be slaughtered by the village. 
that sent a very strong message to the rest of the villagers that these kids are telling them a very important message. Reaching out to all this group means that we want to see the health of the land. We want to work with the community to make sure that gravies and other wildlife have a chance. Why do I say that? It's because imagine you are navigating within New York City, and you don't have a GPS in your car. There's somewhere you want to go, but you don't know where to go. But you don't have a navigation system within your car. How many of us will get this way through New York? <laughs> That's the same case with me within my landscape. I use the gravis to trace the water, I use the gravis to trace where this pasture, and I feel like it's an important component within my life. I can't do without them. I will feel lonely. So I hereby call upon you to consider supporting Grave Zebra Trust to make sure that I don't lose an important part of my heritage. Thank you.